Hello everyone, this is week 10 and um, we finished up kind of our overview of the primary cultures that come into America and influence us. We've already talked about the African culture and Spanish culture mixing in the Caribbean, creating a Latin American music with a lot of rhythm. We've talked about the Spanish culture simply coming into South America, Mexico, bringing the guitar, coming into the Southwest United States. We've also talked about the Scot-Irish who were basically kicked out of uh, Great Britain. Remember Scotland is a country, Ireland's a country. The king didn't, didn't like a certain group of Irish, didn't like a certain group of, of Scottish, pushed them into a space in Northern Ireland and they intermingled. They came to America, settled in the Appalachian Mountains, if you recall our previous lecture, that orange part on the map. They were so close to the African slaves, former slaves, I should say, who uh, were there after the Civil War from 1860 to 1900, um, that their, their two musics mixed together, you might recall. Both used the guitar, um, and then the, the African-American um, uh, music uh, in the blues area went with the Texas blues, you'll recall, a different sound for the Mississippi blues, which influenced most of Chicago blues, which is simply Mississippi blues amplified, and the Piedmont blues, which featured the harmonica. Now, there are many kinds of blueses, because all over the United States, as the, the African-American freed slaves moved north to the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, this music spread and took on a character of the different cities it went to. Uh, Kansas City, there's a Detroit blues, there's a Nashville country kind of blues, there's a, there's a blues up, up the coast. And the same thing happens we have, with jazz. We haven't talked about jazz, but I'll we'll talk about it a little bit in a second. So these are the cultures we've identified, three of the four, but what about the Europeans? Where did they settle? Well, we know they settled along the coast there, the original 13 colonies. But what was their big center of culture and music? You know, we already talked about how the big center for blues from was, was uh, Mississippi and then Chicago. But the town that really is the true melting pot in this country is New York City. There's a lot of discussion right now about immigration in our, local, our, our current time. Immigration back then amounted to, be, from the Civil War all the way through up to, and that's about 1865, all the way through into, really the current day, but into World War I, say 18, 1914. That 40 or 50 year period is the period we're talking about right now. That's when, in large numbers, as Europe was ripping apart, if you understand the history here, Europe's a bunch of countries, they start fighting with each other. That means immigrants or, uh, you know, they, they leave and they try and get to America where there is no war fighting. So World War I is when everything blew up. But these countries have been fighting for a long time. There were problems with work. There were problems with, they don't have the land we have there. Um, the system was breaking down. People were poor. So again, we have a case of the poorest of the populations in most cases coming over to the New World. This was their answer. Okay? And they all came through one place called Ellis Island. It was an island that was built to process these immigrants. They basically would give a real quick look at them and see if they looked healthy and if they didn't they thought they might have something wrong with them. They put them into the clinic and they make sure no one came in with diseases and that kind of a thing. A lot of uh, people came over just maybe the kids got on there by themselves. Their, parent, their family sent them over to America just to have a better life. There was a lot of that. A lot of youth. Um, I can track my family back on the my father's side. Um, I know they came to Ellis Island. They went to Wisconsin for a short time, but then it settled in Chicago. And if you know anything about the history of Chicago and the Irish political scene, my great grandfather he couldn't find a job. He didn't have a job other than you know what he could do, but uh, farming back in Ireland, and he became a Chicago cop. <laughs> that's, not, that's still going on today in all kinds of ways. But as a sidebar, 
So everyone has a story of these roots. It would be cool for you to check out yours and uh, make sure you know what they are. But all these immigrants came from Romania, Poland, Italy, Germany, England. More English came in the late 1800s into the World War I. The, the, the Irish showed up. Just the, not the Scott Irish, but the Irish. The, uh, um, the, the Jewish population came from Jerusalem. The, they came in droves. All of those countries in Europe, France, they all came. And they settled in New York. And they had a lot of jobs there. New York's a big town. But they also lived in a lot of poverty for a long time. And they had the dirtiest jobs there were, the roughest jobs there were. They worked in sewing fa uh, factories, you know. And they had a problem where they put the kids to work, too. And then they finally enacted child labor laws. So all these immigrants from Europe that you hear about, they really don't come in large amounts until after the Civil War. So Europe comes in. We already know what's happened before the Civil War and after the Civil War in the South. What did they start? Well, New York City became the place where they, there was so much opportunity there. They had a tradition in Europe of ballet. They liked dancing. They had a tradition in, in, in Europe of opera. They liked singing. They had a great tradition in Europe of acting, particularly in England. But they always separated them. You know, they never would put the, all of them together. They'd either have a play with talking, they'd have a ballet with dancing, or they'd have an opera with singing. And none, none of the others would switch off. and They would never intertwine. It is in America where they intertwine. But it started in a real rough way. And I mean rough way. These were old theaters that were built in, in New York City in the 1870s, 1880s. And they had what they called vaudeville. And that's what the videos have. And you'll notice the video shows you some actual vaudeville. Vaudeville is basically a variety show. Okay, we call it a variety show in, our, in my day on TV. A variety show. They don't have a lot of variety shows on TV too much anymore these days. They're usually sitcoms, that kind of thing, as you know. Sports. But a variety show would have a variety of acts. So you would have a dancer. You would have a singer. Okay. You would have an actor give a speech. You would have a juggler. You would have a dog act. You would have animal tricks, skating, all kinds, you know, roller skating on stage. This melting pot of people also created a melting pot of the arts. And eventually it leads to a lot of forms, but one form that becomes uniquely American is the American musical. Just to give you an idea today, and there used to be a few more. Today in New York City, you know where Times Square is, where they have the um, New Year's Eve. In that area, that's the theater district, there are 39 theaters there operating right now, all of them with an average of 5,000 seats. Okay? The Chicago Theater downtown in Chicago is not that big. Uh, Orchestra Hall, where the symphony plays, is probably about 2,000 seats. These are big theaters they made for all the immigrants they'd go and they could spend the whole day on a Saturday for a nickel and sit in the balcony and watch comedians and watch dancers and have bands play and singers and comedy and nothing. That's really what vaudeville created this whole melting pot. Now what's interesting, when the slaves were freed in the early days after the Civil War, they pretty much worked on the farm, but eventually they moved north too because they, as I told you, they weren't making a lot of money and they saw an opportunity in this early, early music business if they had talent, like you remember the Nicholas Brothers, those two kids, right? Those are two guys that started in vaudeville, okay, as kids. Um, and um, many of the people that uh, died in, uh, from my generation that started in vaudeville in, uh, in, in the later days. But the African Americans went north also and tried to make it. But before the ex-slaves came to New York and came north, they had something that they called mil minstrel shows. There's two kinds of minstrel shows. The primary one is the white minstrel shows where white uh, Europeans would paint their face black and imitate the happy slave, so to speak. I mean, that's what they was. There, there was a minstrel show had three specific acts. The middle act is always, was always some kind of plantation scene where the ex-slaves would be standing around telling jokes. And it was somewhat of a means of saying, oh, well, we know we had slavery, and then we fought the Civil War, and we won, and now the slaves are all happy. The truth was not that, of course. But it became comedic, and this is where the black stereotype characters came into play in America. Aunt Jemima, 
uh, the scared uh, black man when he sees a ghost, all those things that were stereotypical and carried themselves into TV all the way into my day. All those black stereotypes, um, they all were developed in the minstrel show. Now what came first, minstrel show or vaudeville? Kind of same time, vaudeville's a little later, it's more sophisticated. Minstrel shows could be in very small theaters, little small stages, that kind of a thing. But that's the white minstrel show. Remember, the white minstrel show are white performers only with black face pretending to be black. The black minstrel show came um, after the white minstrel show disappeared. Now, mind you, the, the, the white minstrel show appeared before the Civil War. During the Civil War, it, went, it, it, it became less popular because we were fighting uh, with the South. And then one of our missions eventually was to free... The slaves, it wasn't really kosher, right? It wasn't really popular then. But then the African Americans came north, and in order to replace that, I mean, they started doing their own minstrel shows, obviously with their own black face. And, and, but they had a different theme. They had the same three acts, but they, they, they portrayed for the first time some of the sophistication of the black musical culture. And they had already developed spirituals in their churches in the South, those spirituals came north into places like New York City and Chicago eventually and other cities, Baltimore, Detroit, and played all black shows. The shows were still managed and organized by white uh, theater managers. But this was an opportunity for an African American ex-slave or the son of, a, of an ex-slave to make some money and, and make it and be popular. And there were some very early ones and most of them were dancers as we taught the Nicholas Brothers and another dancing Bojangles because they had this unique tap thing. So that's kind of what the history is, but what we want to understand is that it was the Europeans, Europe, that brought all of their musical culture to New York City and formed this melting pot. Now, as the musical, the musical then is a collection of dancing, of singing and acting. It puts it all together. That's the beginnings of the American musical. And somebody had to write those songs. Who wrote those songs? Interestingly enough, a very large percentage of these songwriters in the early days of, of Broadway, the early days of the musical, were people like Irving Berlin, all right, who wrote God Bless America, uh, George M. Cohen, I mean Yankee Doodle Dandy. This is more into the early 1900s as America is becoming very patriotic. There were many of them were Jewish, okay. And the, the, there's a history, you, if, you, if you should know, there's a lot of um, ownership and management of the entertainment business that comes from the Jewish uh, culture, the Jewish population in America. A lot of your movies, theaters, that type of thing, all right? You'll notice a lot of Jewish uh, people in that business. It comes from their early days in New York. They did sing and dance as well, but they really became the management operations of the early theaters in New York, a large percentage of them. And there wasn't all of them, but it was, but it was a good percentage. And they have a dominant role all the way in through today, uh, including in the record business later on, which we'll talk about next week when we talk about the history of the music business. This is the very beginning. So what did one thing that the Europeans brought us was song and dance and theater and acting and show. And if you didn't have all this happening 100 years ago, you would not have Hamilton, the show today. Okay, You wouldn't have all that stuff. Thousands of songs written by composers. And they all had, the, they all kind of, in the early days, they wrote, sitting at their pianos and there was a section in New York about a block sometimes two blocks long about you know like a block this way and a block that way where every single room there's a you could run a small room with a piano if you were a composer a songwriter they really call them and you could sit and write songs all day and the way they would do this is they would write a song they would find some star or some sub sub uh, singer on in the Broadway theaters remember I told you there was a little ton of them back then and they'd have them come up, and then they'd have they'd pitch the song. They pitch means they'd play the song for a producer of a Broadway production of a musical, and say, "Here, I've got a good one." And then he'd hire a singer, and she'd sing, "I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy." And if the producer liked the song, he might write a whole show around it. Okay, there were hundreds and hundreds of these songwriters in New York City. Many of those were also uh, Jewish. The most famous ones are certainly. Gilbert and Sullivan, who wrote Sound of Music, for example, that's, that's a late, late songwriter. Uh, I mentioned George M. Cohen and Irving Berlin. Irving Berlin has had so many hits, so many songs you've heard, you don't even know they're his. <laughs> but um, this was a very the beginning of the, of the songwriting business, and of course it also formed the, the 
what was happening in the beginning was these guys would write songs and then the producers would take the songs and they would like make all the money on it. And then the songwriters at the pianos in, the, in this block and a half of area, uh, they got organized and formed um, efforts to form copyright laws for songs in America, right? So that a composer owns the copyright of the song and gets a piece. Now next week we're going to break out for you and show you how much money is made on a record today or a streaming video. Um, who it makes the most money. It's not the singer and it's not always the songwriter, certainly. Uh, there's a lot of people in between, but that's another subject. What do they call, there's an area, this area where all these early composers wrote for these hundreds and hundreds of theaters in New York City for the incoming immigrants. It was an area they called Tin Pan Alley. Three words. Tin, like tin can, a pan, an alley. They called it an alley. It was really a block and a half or two with hundreds of pianos and when, there was no air conditioning so all these little small rooms had windows right they cranked the windows up and you might walk down there on a Saturday afternoon or, or a Friday and um, you hear so many pianos going at one time it's not like a bunch of people were knocking pans together and that's how it got its name okay so Tin Pen Alley is an important thing to know let's go to one other uh, area that is important that the Europeans brought to us and it's true they're military bands this is separate from the Broadway New York scene oh by the way all of those theaters in New York they were duplicated around the country um, in places in the big cities and if you, you all should know where the Chicago theater is right down, uh, down on State Street in Chicago that is an originally a vaudeville stage in Chicago one of the major ones in the world now, of course, it has various acts. So, the other area I want to touch on, though, is military bands in Europe. We already talked a little about the fife and drum and the military. When that came to America, we, started, we did it like them in the beginning, too. We sounded like the European bands, but it changed. And the Marine Band, the, when the Marines were formed, the Marine Band was formed, and, and um, there was a small young kid whose father was in the Marine Band, and he loved music. His father made him a little, the helper uh, boy for the Marine Band when he was in it. The Marine Band is based in Washington, D.C. Today it's called the President's Own. I just saw them a week ago at Chicago Orchestra Hall with some friends of mine who are band teachers around here. It's considered the best band in the world, but John Philip Sousa was that young 12-year-old boy, and John Philip Sousa served 12 years in the Marines. And the American band style changed everything for bands. It's still evolving today. But after 12 years of being the head of the Marine Band, John Philip Sousa formed his own band. Not a military band, but a public band, an entertainment band. And he toured all over America with this band by railroad. He becomes the first pop star in America because everyone in all of America knew who John Philip Sousa was and likely saw him live. Just to give you an idea how popular bands were, and we're talking about marching band style bands, not rock bands, obviously. Bands that sat. They did parades, too. Uh, at one time in Illinois, prior to 1900 or right around, there were more bands in Illinois than there were towns. Shocking. <laughs> but in a, in a town like Joliet, you'd have the high school band, you'd have a couple of factory bands, the police department had a band, right? The fraternities had the band, you know, factories had bands, you know, the steel companies and Gary had a band. So bands were really big. And so those bands are important in our discussion because I haven't talked about jazz yet. Because what happens with jazz is all the spirituals and the blues of the South get mixed in with the instruments, the horns of the bands, the military bands after the Civil War. And those horns that were played, the trombone, the clarinet, the trumpet, the tuba, they show up in New Orleans after the Civil War. And that, my friend, is where jazz tries to imitate the bluesy sound of the African American spiritual and the blues on a horn. And it spawns jazz. The number one person to start that, Louis Armstrong, which we'll talk about next week when we talk about the pop eras. So, this week is about the band influence. You'll see videos on how bands evolved. It's about the singing, dancing, and acting that all comes together in New York with all the Europeans and generates the, the, the um, Broadway musical, as they call it today. And it generates the musical on film, right? Because all that happened with the movies when it went to Los Angeles, when the technology of the movies came in in the 1920s, 
after silent movies, you had soundies, they call them. Sound music, you could hear the sound too. And that's what started to kill Tin Pan Alley in New York, but it never killed the theaters. It's just all the writers went to, went to Los Angeles. So that's kind of a synopsis. I hope you enjoy the videos. Uh, this is a really important discussion about how America took all the cultures of the world and created their own music. And then at the end of the class, you'll find out we exported it all over the world, including rap, which I saw in Hong Kong, kids rapping on the streets. So that's crazy, man. All right, good luck. See you later.